Hey, everybody, it's the Drive School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and joining me again today is my friend, Pastor Brademeyer. How you doing, man? You know, um, I'm doing okay. I got surgery coming up. I have knee problems, and I got to get them fixed, and that's tomorrow. So <laughs> uh, we'll see if I can keep my head on, on task here today instead of worrying about that. This will give you something to distract yourself with. And like, I'm glad that we get you in one of your last like painkiller free moments for a little while. So well, maybe I'll be more fun when on painkillers. I don't know. Yeah, but we do philosophy. And I don't know if those are going to necessarily help with right thinking. So um, well, there's a lot of people who've tried through history, right? And, and I agree with you, it doesn't usually work out very good. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe instead of like getting lost in those weeds, uh, let's also talk about some bad reasoning. Uh, atheists uh you, you don't have to go too far on the internet to have like a 12 year old quoting richard dawkins in a sarcastic voice against christians um how do we respond to this like it does are their claims valid do they make sense is this all nonsense talk to me a little all right so there's different schools of atheism sometimes when we talk about atheists we assume they're all kind of on the same page talking about the same stuff and as with people who defend you know christian belief there are people who are better at it and there are people who are worse at it um, so, you know, if you want to read an atheist, I don't actually recommend you read atheists if, unless you are just a glutton for punishment or something. But, um, uh, you know, David Hume, the philo Scottish philosopher, he that guy is brilliant and he has some very profound challenges for the faith. I'd say he's a very strong defender of atheism. And then you have people like Dawkins and Harris and Hitchens, the new atheists, who are very, very weak defenders of atheism. In fact, their arguments aren't really arguments. They're more assertions, right? Mm -hmm. And um, as I was kind of reviewing this stuff, because it's been a while since I've looked at it to, to, um, to prepare myself and remember what I was talking about today, it struck me as I was going through this about how little argumentation they actually make. It's just asserting God does not exist. Therefore, anything you can point to that proves God's existence must be interpreted wrong by you because God doesn't exist, which is a circular argument. Right? It's so not actually an argument at all. So kind of for, for our listeners, and, and not for me at all, uh, what's the difference between an argument and an assertion? So an assertion is saying the sky is blue. I'm just asserting a thing, just saying it, pointing out, right? An argument would be, I you know, the sky is blue. Blue is this. Um, therefore, we can draw this conclusion from these premises, these things we've observed in, in nature or whatever. And, you know, the thing about an assertion is, I guess I, I did myself no favors by saying the sky is blue. A better assertion would be thing, something that's a little bit less tangible, like saying murder is evil, right? Mm -hmm. That's an assertion. Now, that happens to be a true assertion, but it needs to be proved and demonstrated. You can't just say murder is evil and leave it like that if you're in an argument about somebody with somebody who says, you know, actually murder is okay sometimes. You can't just say, well, murder is bad and leave it at that. You actually have to demonstrate your claim and prove it. Which is one of the things that I guess before we even really get into the arguments that frustrates me a lot about the new atheists. If you talk to them about God being real, and I don't like to talk about God existing because philosophically speaking, existence is something that creatures do. God is He's beyond things like existing. He just is, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit trippy, but a saying that God exists assumes that he's inside the universe like we are, that he's part of the created order, which is ultimately the major misstep the new atheists make, right? That's the kind mm -hmm. of God they're arguing against, which is a straw man. That's not what we say God is in his divine nature, right? He's beyond creation. Um, but the first thing that they'll say is, well, you say God exists, so the burden of proof is on you to say that. Well, in logic, the burden of proof is on whoever is bringing the argument to the table, whether that's a positive claim or a negative claim. So if I come to the table and say God is real, I am obligated, philosophically speaking, to demonstrate that. If I come to the table and say God does not exist, God is not real, I am also obligated to demonstrate that. Right? It's not because that one or the other has point. that obligation, it's both. It's right. That's how argumentation works in logic, right? Whatever your position is, you have to demonstrate it. You don't get to get a pass just because your position is the negative position. It's a cop-out. It's lazy is what it mm -hmm. is, which is why when you read their books, it all just boils down to assertions. God doesn't exist. And then they say, well, but people have religious experiences. There's holy books. Well, those things must be misinterpreted because God doesn't exist. And that's just what they keep coming back to is just this assertion. Right. So there's no argument. They just assume their point and then read that into everything. They make a, you know, an a priori by the very nature of things assumption that God cannot be real and therefore cannot be a causal explanation for anything. And so anything you bring to the table that says that just doesn't count. You had to jump from the sky is blue to murder is wrong. And that, that might actually be a useful kind of thing for this. So it, it's one thing for me to say the sky is blue. 
uh, and I can just look up. Uh, and so in the same way that the atheist can say, well, I have never seen God. Uh, but the problem is then if, if you sort of have everybody with their own personal experiences rejecting everybody else's own personal experiences, um, what do you do with, then with the people who said, I saw Jesus rise from the dead? Or, or even right. just like the, the crazy ones, because you have to acknowledge that everybody's making claims. Like I saw Jesus in this grilled cheese sandwich. Um, like maybe we should, maybe we we can work our way through these. You're right. Instead of just making assertions. Well, that's right. And then this is the thing with the evidence. You have to take each piece of evidence one at a time because some evidence is good, some evidence is bad. You know, the the sweet little old lady that found Jesus in her grilled cheese sandwich meant very well, but that's not compelling evidence, and it probably was a fluke, right? Um, there are people who have religious experiences. You know, I have people in my church. I've been here long enough. They tell me about weird things that they've experienced over the years. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe it's because they were really stressed out. I don't know, but they have experiences and human beings have had profound religious experiences, things that transcend normal everyday experience that you know defies just a, a purely natural explanation. And that's really what these new atheists try to do. One of the ways that they kind of control the argument is to reject everything that's not scientifically measurable, right? So everything has to be something you can put measurement and weight to, you can run through the laboratory. That's evidence. Anything outside of that doesn't count. And which leads them to some very bizarre conclusions, right? So for example, love, right? What is that? Put that in a test tube, weigh it, demonstrate it. Well, you can't. You can point to, you know, various parts of my brain firing up. You can point to chemical reactions. You can point to hormone levels, but none of that is love. If you go to your sweetie pie and you say, oh, sweetie pie, I have this strong release of dopamine when I'm around you. She's not going to be impressed by that, you know, because uh, that's not love. We all know love is bigger than, or what is justice or mm -hmm. fairness, or equality, or, you know, these things that we talk about, they can't be weighed or measured. And yet they're very, very real. And we all know they're real and we all operate with it. Or even just think about like written language or like stop signs, symbols, you know, why do you stop at the stop sign? Because it's part of a real reality. But the sign in and of itself doesn't make you stop. It's literally a piece of metal with red paint and some white reflective stuff on it, right? That's all it is. So why do you attach all these meanings and values to it? That means that there's something beyond what's merely physical. And we all every day live our lives like this. So the first thing that we'd say they're wrong about is that they reduce everything to just the, the physical, the natural world, as they say. And um, and even their own lived experience would invalidate that, right? So it's it's a laughably simplistic assertion. And, uh, and that's the problem with all of this, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know what else you want me to say about it because it's not good philosophy. So um, just to kind of push on the stop sign then, and maybe we can just div dive a little deeper. I feel like that might also be like, I think that might also be a, a useful sort of approach. And because I, I know that a, an atheist, uh, especially a new atheist would write sort of along the way that if religion is useful to sort of maintain an orderly society, that's great. But also you just have to realize you could keep driving and the stop sign is useful, not because of that that's the piece of metal makes my car stop but because i trust that everybody else is acting according to that system for an ordered society and so then the the, the proposition the assertion that they're making is that when religion is bad for society just stop stopping at the stop sign right that's um uh, that is one of the things they say in fact that's one of their major claims against religion is that religion is fundamentally immoral and and they paint with a broad brush here which is really fascinating because um if we were to judge any system by the worst actors in it, well, what system would we have that would not be considered immoral? Because I've seen you know, plenty of things through history where science at times has done really terrible stuff. Look at the Nazi experiments they did on concentration camps. Look at the stuff that our government did on its own citizens back in the 60s. You know, all the black men down south that were infected with syphilis and denied treatment just so we would see what would happen or how we you know, have done some of these really bizarre things through history, both in this country and in other places in the name of science. And so, you know, if we're going to apply that same criterion that we use to judge religion by the zealots and the suicide bombers and, the, you know, the pedophile priests and whatever, well, we have to do the same thing to science, too. And we end up with saying, well, that's immoral as well. So we clearly can't trust any of that evidence. So now we have no evidence one way or the other about anything, which means apparently we have no knowledge. So we might as well just quit talking at this point, right? Or attach it to leaders. And this is really becoming a, a first commandment issue because we, we want a leader who is without sin. And so the, the cause is worthwhile if the leader is without sin. And, and here's where we start to throw rocks at anybody who, quite frankly, already disagrees with us. I mean, I've heard the charge too, you know, you know how many more people God has killed in the Bible than the devil. So clearly he's the bad guy. Um, right. How do we respond to something like this? Well, the first thing is, is that the person who's saying that doesn't really want to have a discussion with you. They really don't. They just, they want to well, they're either one of two things. They're either mad at God and they're trying to justify it, or they're trying to just score points so they can be, you know, righteous in their own eyes, right? 
And so it's a hard thing to have that discussion. So how would I respond to somebody who tells me that God is more evil than the devil? I, I don't know that I would have a working response because it would just so baffle me that someone could actually think that, hmm. right? You know, that, I mean, because I mean, if you want to follow the logic on this, okay, if God is the creator, he makes all things, everything is his, then life is his to give or receive and to retrieve as he sees fit. It belongs to him. Hmm. And the assumption behind that statement is that I have a, unfettered right to life apart from God, right? That in and of myself, I have a right to be, to exist. And as Christians, we should understand that rights aren't really things that we have. Rights is legal language. It's something we have in relationship to the state, right? But we have gifts from God. We have these things that he blesses us with. We have things to steward. Rights aren't, that's not our language. That's enlightenment talk, right? Which is useful when you're talking to people about legal stuff. But it's not useful when we're talking about philosophy or the church necessarily. So when we start to talk about gifts, we have gifts from God. It also starts to paint a character. We have, we have good gifts from God because we have a good God. And that also means then when God takes a life, well, it's not a different God. He is ontologically the same. He is the same God in his being. Um, so even when he takes a life, it is it is for good. Um, and, and that's one of those things that, that we're allowed to disagree with him on because we don't like, but also we sort of have to acknowledge he's smarter than us and also has a better track record with doing the right thing than us. So um, maybe, maybe let's at least pause. Well, and, and the other thing too, is that it also assumes that I have sufficient moral character to judge not only other people, but God himself. And Apparently, okay. my moral character is so great as I make this argument that I do not deserve the wage of my sin, which is death. Mm. And so, you know, what, what what's coming to the table here is that this person who says this has a very different view of the human person than you or I do as Christians. Right? They don't see themselves as sinners. They don't see themselves as somebody in need of a savior. They don't see themselves as somebody who is deficient in some ways. They see themselves as as a pure actor which then justifies all the other things that come in their argument. And that won't be something that they'll bring out or even state, but it has to be logically there for this argument to make sense. Right. So this is, this is all of the assumptions that are brought into the assertions that, that we get right. to sort of unpack. And so when somebody says, you know, God is more evil than the devil, we get to just sort of say, let's take a step back and, and look at all the things that, that we're, we're taking for granted here. And, and so, okay, you know, I, I, you know, here's the thing. I don't know that we have to defend God, honestly. That's fair. He's God. He, he defends himself, right? And uh, his word stands as true, whether we want it to or not. So I think we can just point out as if we talk to somebody about this, if someone we care about that we want to talk to them about this, we could say, well, you know, this is how we see the human condition. And this is how we see God. And we understand all this stuff to be a gift. And, you know, the fact is that every gift becomes something that we don't have at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Even life itself is a gift that ultimately expires. If you're given a present, it eventually breaks, wears out, you know, and it just, it doesn't stay, it doesn't last forever. That's just the nature of this world that we live in. And we believe that there's even a greater gift, which is life, not just in this world, but life that goes through this world into the next. Um, you know, that there's actually forgiveness of sins that we don't just wink out of existence as a cosmic accident that happens to have an illusion of, of consciousness, right? Um, but uh, the other thing I think you can do is you can also talk about, okay, well, let's say then that, that you know, that you're judging God by a moral standard, Whence does this moral standard come? You know, where is the ground of this thing that you're using to judge God, right? Because it has to come from somewhere. There actually has to be an actual right and wrong. And the new atheists actually do try to address this. And in their view, what makes right and wrong is just pain and pleasure, right? That which yeah. makes people happy and that which hurts them. Okay. Um, but if you've ever been around children, you know that uh, discipline and uh, things that are required to live an adult life and to grow up and to be a decent person who's not a jerk to be around actually requires some short-term pain. And so a lot of moral exercise. character development requires yeah. suffering, which counters their argument. Right. Because their argument is, is that which produces happiness is good and that which produces evil is, is painful. Or, you know, that which is painful is evil, I should say. And so just the fact that like when a little kid is trying to steal a toy from their friend, that's going to make them happy. You don't let them do that because that's breaking the seventh commandment. And it causes them moral anguish at the time. It causes them, you know, emotional distress, but that's still something they need to learn to do. And so, you know, the, the view, they, they have an incoherent view of morality, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then trying to judge God by this incoherent standard doesn't make sense because it's incoherent at its foundation. Right. At, at its worst case, we're bickering about the timeline because like you can say, well, it, it hurts now, but it's worthwhile later. And, and then we just get to stretch later into the life everlasting and the resurrection of the body um, that 
again, you, you're, you're making the assumption that just can't be there. So if there is no tomorrow, well, why not eat and drink and be merry? Right. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really one of the frustrating things with talking to the new atheists. They do a lot of goalpost shifting. So mm. we start talking about this stuff and then they just keep shifting the goalposts. So if you do address their claim, then they'll change it to something else. And, um, you know, just because, again, they have asserted there is no God, therefore nothing that you say could prove that. And so if you go in, if you actually have a decent response to one of their claims, they're just going to talk about something else. They're not actually going to concede the point, which at that point, we understand that we're not dealing with people who actually care about reason debate. They're not dealing with people who actually care about truth. We deal with, we're dealing with people who have an agenda, right? And it's no uh, yeah. less an agenda than, say, the missionary who wants to convert people to the true and living God and faith in him. Um, but it is an agenda, and it is a religious agenda. Mm -hmm. Just because there's no God involved doesn't mean it's any less a religious system. Right, and then we get to sort of have the broader conversation that we've had a lot of times before, but are you trying to help or trying to win? Because if all you're really trying to do is prove somebody wrong who happens to be wrong on the internet, that's that's well past a full-time job. You're going to find more wrong people on the internet. Um, but if this is genuinely to help, when you see that this is no longer a helpful discussion, you're allowed to check out from it and say, the Lord is the good shepherd. He will gather the souls in as and when and through whom he, he wills. And that's the other thing, too. The new atheists really thrive as a general rule on being provocative and really getting underneath your skin because they want to see you flip out. And then when you, you know, lose your temper, you get frustrated, you say something you didn't mean to say. The ha, see, you religious people are a bunch of irrational jerks. Right. And so it just becomes more uh, a confirmation of what they hold and believe. And so, um, you know, again, you don't have to defend Jesus. He doesn't need defending. Hmm. Um, you don't reason people into the faith. You know, we should, sure, the Bible says we should give a, a defense of what we believe. So by all, by all means, make a defense of the faith. Yeah. But understand that it's not up to you to convert this person to being a Christian. And if you, you know, don't make a perfect argument or you slip up, it doesn't mean either that somebody's going to be lost to hell, right? We, unfortunately, are not that powerful, right? Fortunately. <laughs> I'm really glad I'm not that powerful. I don't use yeah, my powers right. for evil. Um <laughs> I, I, I don't well, want the great responsibility that comes with it. Thanks, Spider-Man, for pointing that out. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so when we're engaging with this, then um, I, I think we've been, been given a lot of a lot of just even points to consider. Like, is this an assertion or a real argument? Are you trying to help or trying to win? Uh, and as you start to sort through this, it actually becomes more and more common that it's just there are places where it's just not worth your time. Right. Right. And and the last thing that they do, and I think this is honestly probably the strongest argument that they make. Um, they claim that faith is something completely without evidence. And they, that's how they define faith is without evidence. So therefore, it cannot be falsified. You can't bring evidence to show that it doesn't exist, so on and so forth. And then that's what they really go after, because everything else they say is just an assertion. This is actually an argument that, that they make. It's a bad argument because it relies on a bad definition of faith. No Christian philosopher would ever say, or, or Christian theologian, would ever have taught that faith is without evidence. Yes, faith is hope in things which we do not see, as Paul said, but it is not without evidence because faith is something that takes place in the real world where God really acts. And so we can point to the eyewitnesses like he talked about of the resurrection. We can point to, you know, um, eyewitness accounts of various miracles that God has done, both in and outside of the scriptures. And we do have to take them as historical accounts. And that is evidence to get us entered into the column that supports our claims. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, not everybody gets to see this stuff, but somebody did. And uh, we get to evaluate those claims as those claims, right? And if you want to a priori say this stuff doesn't happen, therefore that's not true, that's fine. But understand that you're making a circular argument. You're not actually making a good argument based on the evidence. You're ignoring the evidence that doesn't prove your point. It's just well, confirmation bias. Yeah, that's not how it works anywhere else. Not everybody gets to see this, but not everybody gets to see everything. Like there are a lot of things in the world that I have not seen but believe in because I trust the, the, the people around me who have, who have seen them, who have recorded right. them, who have presented them. Right. All right. Well, Pastor Brademeyer, the Lord be with you in surgery, and uh, we'll see you on the other side of it. All right. We hope so. <laughs> if not, I'll see you up there. Sounds good to me. All right. Bye, friend.